Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to uh, begin the last session of the day. And uh, thank you for everyone who's come back in. Uh, in case you've forgotten, I'm Bruce Rittman from Arizona State University. And I want Joan Rose to feel better, make her put her in a good mood. So I, I also won the Clark Prize, but it was way back in 1994. So you can feel young, Joan. All right, so we have a session here on new and innovative sustainable technologies. And there's a little saying in baseball. You've all heard about this baseball saying about the cleanup hitter. You know, it's the best hitter, the one who's going to hit the big home run to win the game. Well, the thing is, in this section, we have three cleanup hitters, one right after the other. So I'm really excited about, about this. And our first one is Dr. Menachem Elimelech from uh, Yale University. He is the Clark Prize winner of 2005. Yeah. So he's the uh, Roberto Gozuit, uh Professor of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at Yale and also Director of their Environmental Engineering Program, their founding director, I should say. His research is in, in the water energy nexus, including membrane processes and desalination and osmosis and nanomaterials, and he does the whole thing here. And finally, the last thing I'm going to say is Manny was elected to the National Academy of, Academy of Engineering in 2006. So please, Manny, come up. Okay. I think you're fine. okay, thank you, Bruce, for the kind introduction, and thanks, uh, NWRR, for the invitation. And I would like to congratulate David, he used to sit there, I don't know, for the 2014 Clark Prize. So today I'll talk about Ford Osmosis, and the titles say progress and challenges, but I will focus mostly on the challenges and then what applications result from these challenges. And I assume that some of you do not know what is Ford Osmosis. I will try to explain it. And the best way to explain it by starting with reverse osmosis that all of us know. In reverse osmosis, we have a semi-permeable membrane, and we have a, a saline feed solution, and we apply hydraulic pressure to the saline water to increase the chemical potential of the water. So the water will flow in this direction, and we can get desalination. In this process, as you see from this uh, diagram, uh, again, the driving force would be the water permeability coefficient times the pressure, let's see, there is a laser here, uh, times the uh, difference in the pressure, uh, hydraulic pressure and osmotic pressure. Here we do not want the osmotic pressure, it's not desirable. And in this diagram, reverse osmosis uh, cover the range that you see here. The other process, which is forward osmosis, we have semi-permeable membrane of the same nature, and on the other side of the feed uh, solution, we have a draw solution, a solution with high concentration. So water will flow by osmotic flow naturally to the draw solution. And of course, in the future, I mean, as you will see, we need to separate the draw solution from the fresh water so we can use the process again. The driving force here will be just the osmotic pressure. There is no hydraulic pressure, as you see for this um, uh, equation. And in this diagram, for the osmosis is just at that point. Like, I will move here, otherwise the laser will hit you. <laughs> OK, so as you see here, it's just in the point here. There is another process that uh, in this family of what we call engineered osmosis, it's pressure retarded osmosis. In a way, it's almost like forward osmosis, but the other side that you have the high draw solution is pressurized, and this pressure eventually can be released, this pressurized solution can be released through a turbine to produce electricity. So all these processes, again, again we see here, the driving force will be, again, the osmotic pressure minus this uh, formed hydraulic pressure. And in this diagram, it will be on this side here. So all these processes can fit into one diagram. We call it engineered osmosis. Uh, this is pressure retarded osmosis. This is forward osmosis. And my talk will focus only on forward osmosis that you see here. So, so in this talk, I will cover uh, three, uh, what I view, important aspects of forward osmosis that you see here and then see how these uh, aspects drive the application, and I'll show you why the application will be of uh, such nature because of the challenges that I'm going to describe. And I will start with the uh, first aspect of the energy. Let's see here. 
So, so th this is the forward osmosis process. Again, you have a, a membrane here that you see here, and a, a, on one side you have a, a feed water, the other side you have a draw solution. The water will flow naturally by osmosis, but the process doesn't end there. You need eventually to have a process that you recover the draw solution to use it again and get the fresh water. So all the energy that we need is in this side of the process. And uh, I would like now to discuss uh, several aspects of, uh, related to energy, because many people, when they think about forward osmosis, they just look at the first part and forget that you have an next part. So they think, OK, water flow by osmosis, and it's no energy, no pressure, and we can get everything for free. So I would like now to address this aspect of energy. And there are no free lunches. Maybe some of you got free lunch here, at least the <laughs> Clark laureates, we got a free lunch, and maybe the students. But in nature, there are no free lunches. So we cannot beat thermodynamics, as you're going to, I'm going to show you soon. So in a way, the separation of the draw solution, the energy will be equivalent or proportional to the osmotic pressure of the draw solution. If you claim that you can generate draw solution with high osmotic pressure that can really desalinate very high salinity water, to recover the draw solution, you will need a lot of energy. So it's proportional to the energy. And I would like to address this aspect of the energy, but I would like also to say, and you'll see it uh, later in the uh, application, that there are some potential innovations that, in, uh, again, we use higher energy, but this will be in the form of thermal energy of low-grade heat, for example. And although the absolute energy will be higher than what I will show you in the calculation, if this energy comes for free, for free, then it could be quite useful. So I would like now to address some aspect of the energy. And I will start again with the process of reverse osmosis that we relatively know. In this graph, you describe, again, the reverse osmosis. We have the feed water. And we need to uh, desalinate and get uh, uh, fresh water, permeate, and then brine. Now, this diagram describes the energy for desalination. Uh, you can think about it again. This is the recovery. You can think about it. This is the osmotic pressure that builds in the uh, uh, channel of the reverse osmosis. And eventually, for example, if you have a 50% recovery, you know that the, dross, the brine will be twice as much as the seawater, as you see here. And you can calculate this energy that is proportional to the osmotic pressure. And it's, a, it's about 1.55 kilowatt hour per cubic meter. So this is just the minimum energy for reverse osmosis. And now let's talk about forward osmosis. In forward osmosis, we will have, again, the fit solution. Then we have a draw solution on one side. You will get now the permeate mixed with the draw solution. And you will get the brine here. Then we need to have another process. And let's take that we recover the draw solution by reverse osmosis, as you see here. And once we recover it, you can get the draw and use it again. Here, in the similar argument, the minimum uh, energy for uh, separation of this a draw solution will be equivalent to the osmotic pressure of the draw solution. I showed you earlier that the minimum energy for reverse osmosis is equivalent to the osmotic pressure of the brine. And because in operation we always need to have the osmotic pressure of the draw solution greater than the brine, the energy will be always, whenever you do FO and RO, will be always higher than, and, than RO. And we can see it here. So, as I indicated, in real operation, as you see here, for example, if we operate forward osmosis in a counter current flow, this will be the feed solution. As you go along the modules, this will be the draw solution. And the same way when you go to counter current flow. In all these operations to get water coming across the membrane, you must have the draw solution greater than the uh, osmotic pressure of the feed, which become the brine. And this is the reason why the energy of this, the, of, uh, that needed for FO and RO will be greater than just RO. So here I describe this aspect of the energy. And again, uh, uh, the reason is because you see a lot of papers. And again, some of the editors here that uh, handling some journals get a lot of them, that someone come, I got a magic draw solution that will not need any energy to de for desalination. It cannot work. You cannot beat thermodynamics. So it, proportional, if you get high osmotic pressure, you will need a lot of energy for desalination. I would like now to address uh, the next uh, topic and about the fouling uh, propensity of FO. And it's another, you see soon, advantage of forward osmosis that you get very little fouling that open the door to many interesting applications. And I would like to start with an experiment that we have done a few years ago, as you see here. We just do experiments in the laboratory that we induce a lot of fouling, as you see here. And in the end of the fouling rod, we simply just rinse the membrane with higher cross flow two or three times higher, 
and we were able to recover the entire, almost the entire flux. I will not show you some data here, but we have done it also with reverse osmosis, and in reverse osmosis, we were not able to recover the flux. We have done it also with other foulants, as you see here. For example, this is the experiment that I showed you in the previous page with alginate, it's a model polysaccharide. The flux at the end of the experiment was here, and we were able to recover almost everything. We did the experiment with proteins, we were able to recover almost everything, and also with scaling, we recover almost all the flux. And the reason is that uh, forward osmosis operate under osmotic pressure as opposed to reverse osmosis, where you have hydraulic pressure that compress the cake and then uh, result in the fact that the cake is not reversible. So this is really a major advantage. You can get reversible fouling in FO, and which will drive some of the application that I'm going to show you later. Also, we, we, I will show you some work that indeed we can even minimize the fouling. Again, not only that we will uh, get reversible fouling, but I can, can minimize the fouling. And I will show you, would like to show you some, experiment, uh, some work that we have done to fabricate a thin film composite, which is anti-fouling by some procedures that describe that shown here. The details are not important, but eventually we will have functional groups that have this polyethylene glycol, or PEO, that is really anti-fouling. And uh, we, again, the work was published here in this reference here, and we were able uh, first to show that you get the contact angle drop from close to 90 to very low value. And when we did fouling experiments, as you're going to see here, this is an uh, experiment in forward osmosis with a very, very, very high concentration of organic foulant. You see that the modified or uh, the anti-fouling membrane, you get very little flux decline, and the reverse, sorry, the control for the osmosis membrane, we get more flux decline. We did, again, also a lot of experiments. Again, on average, the control, uh, you got about 15% flux decline. Here we got about 5% flux decline. But both of them, regardless, you get, you're able to recover all the flux by simple rinsing. Again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not showing you any data for the R, RO experiment, but in RO, reverse osmosis experiments, because of the hydraulic pressure, we were not able to recover all the fluxes you see here. So again, this is another aspect of forward osmosis that later when I talk about the application, you'll see that it will be quite useful in applications that involve uh, feed waters, which are very, very, a very, very high fouling potential. I would like now to talk about the desired membrane properties and some other aspects related to the membranes. And let's start with the, uh, the structural parameters. The current uh, research, or at least the research in the past 10 years on forward osmosis, was just to reduce uh, uh, the structural parameter that I'm going to de describe very soon. And in a way, when you talk about forward osmosis, we have a membrane with a support layer. The draw solution is here. And once water permeates, you dilute the draw solution, so the driving force that the active layer will see will be much, much less than what you, you, you have because of this dilution. This parameter describes the resistance to diffusion of the draw solute. We have draw solute here, and as water comes and dilutes the draw solution, we need to have diffusion of the draw solution to restore the drop of the, uh, of the draw solution concentration. And this describes the resistance to diffusion. Uh, again, we want this value to be uh, low, so it means we need to have membrane with low thickness, low tortuosity, and high porosity, and this is just the diffusion coefficient of the draw solute. Now we can separate these variables because this one is a function of the draw solute. These are all functions of the membranes, and this is what we call the membrane structural parameter. So the challenge in the past few years, or at least 10 years, was really to reduce the structural parameter to a low value that soon you will see will be quite related to the flux that you can get from these membranes. And just to show you where, when we started the uh, uh, forward osmosis about uh, 2004, about 10 years ago, the membranes that were there at that time was reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis is a very, very thick support layer. We were able, again, the structural parameters here was close to 10,000 micron. And later, when we fabricated the first thin film composite uh, forward osmosis membrane, we dropped to 390 micron. Now, how does it translate to water flux? We can see it here. This describes the model water flux as a function of the structural parameter, assuming a draw solution of one molar. Just uh, some num number to compare. And the reverse osmosis membrane with structural parameter close to 10,000 uh, micron will give you 
almost no flux. And this is why foreign osmosis, I mean, you know, was stagnant for many years because there was no membrane for it. This is just the reverse osmosis. We peeled off uh, the PET layer and we were able to get more flux. And later there were some commercial uh, membranes. These are from two companies, Oasis and Hydration Technology. We dropped, again, these are the data for the commercial membrane. And what I think in the future we will likely to be, probably not too far, to be around the 100 micron structural parameter. It's very difficult to get very, very lower value because the membrane will be so, th so thin and fragile and we will not be able to use it. But if you can get less than 100 micron, it will be great. And you see for this one molar draw solution, we can get all the way to 40 LMH if you can get this 100 micron uh, uh, structural parameter. So I would like now to talk about another aspect of a, a related to the membrane, and this is the reverse solute flux. Again, the draw solution concentration is here on this side of the membrane. This is the fit solution, and just because of the concentration difference, you will have diffusion of the draw solute, and it's undesirable because you lose draw solute and it can contaminate the brine if the draw solute is uh, toxic, like ammonia. So, so we need to really to minimize the reverse draw solute. And what's the driving force for this reverse draw solute? So let's start with the driving force for water. The driving force for water is higher osmotic pressure, and you create the higher osmotic pressure by having higher salt concentration, as you see here. However, this high salt concentration that contribute to high water flux will also be, will be the driving force for the reverse uh, draw solute that you see here. So we have now competing thing. If you want to have higher water flux, we will likely have also higher reverse draw solute. We can model this. Uh, we can model uh, these uh, processes. A very, very simple uh, mass transfer that you know, you know, just uh, almost like undergraduate level mass transfer. You analyze this, and you can come up with an analytical expression for the reverse draw solute as a function of the parameters that describe the membrane, like the structural parameter, uh, the diffusion coefficient of the draw solution, and the uh, membrane salt permeability, and so on. And I would like now to show you some data. Uh, fitting to this equation to show you the trends that we get with this reverse uh, draw solute. So these data describe the predicted solute flux based on the equation that I showed you earlier. These are experimental uh, data that we measured in our laboratory for the reverse draw solute flux. And again, this line is at uh, 45 degrees. If all the data fall on this line, it means that the model uh, fits very well uh, the experiments. Let's start with a draw solute that is as large molecular weight, uh, glucose. And glucose will have very little uh, reverse draw solute because it's high molecular weight and it can reject it by the membrane. Again, it's a membrane that we fabricated in a way similar to the active layer, is similar to reverse osmosis membrane. For sodium chloride that you see here, we got higher reverse draw solute flux. And, and you see that the theory and experiments fit very well. Then we wanted to see how the model works for other solute, although they are not relevant as a, for draw solute, just to understand the transport through the membrane. So we took a, a two a uncharged a, a molecules, which a, can go to some degree through the membrane. You cannot get complete rejection. And we see that the reverse salt flux for the, a, this one was a, ethylene glycol was here, and a, for urea. And we were able to predict this a, quite well. So now when you take this uh, uh, water flux and divide it by the uh, uh, solute flux, you see here J, W over J, S, we get a very simple number. And we call this number, again, it's more selectivity, and we call it reverse flux selectivity. And this number will tell you that the ratio of the water flux to the solid flux is simply a ratio for the water permeability coefficient of the active layer of the membrane, the salt permeability coefficient of the active layer of the membrane, and here is the gas constant temperature. This is just the number of species that the salt dissolved to. If it's sodium chloride, it's two. If it's uh, glucose, it's one. And again, it's very surprising because you think all this support layer, you know, uh, affecting flux and so on. But as I told you, the driving force for water flux is the concentration difference, which is also the driving force for the reverse salt flux. So it's not surprising that you see now that these values are, you get this expression. So what it tells you, again, we want in for osmosis to maximize the water flux and minimize the reverse salt flux. So we need to have very high A over B, which is exactly what we need for reverse osmosis. We need high water permeability 
and very low uh, solute uh, permeability. But although it's nice to say it, it's not easy to achieve it. This is all the, again, all the way to when you make membranes. And I would like to discuss why it's difficult to attain this uh, high A over B. All current membranes are constrained by what we call the permeability selectivity trade-off. These are the solution diffusion type membranes that we fabricate nowadays uh, in, in all membranes. It tells you that the water, the salt permeability and the water permeability are linked together by some relationship, cubical relationship as you see here. So if we want higher water permeability, which is desirable, you will also sacrifice and get high salt permeability. So ideally, we want to be here. We want to be very high water permeability and very, very low salt permeability. We cannot do it with current membranes, so we need really a new paradigm for fabrication of membranes, which may involve some either carbon nanotubes or some other thing that uh, achieve separation by sieving and size exclusion rather than solution diffusion mechanism. So with this uh, sort of uh, theoretical background, I would like now to, uh, in critical think of the challenges, I would like now to talk about applications. And I would like to say the first one, that the goal of FO is not to replace RO. Everyone who jump into the FO and say, oh, we have now FO, it's going to re replace RO. Stay calm, all the RO people. RO will stay with us for many, many more years. <laughs> so, so secondly, RO is the gold standard for desalination. You know, when you talk about the energy of desalination, we reach a point now that we are relatively very close to the thermodynamic limit of desalination. You can think about some other processes and so on. RO is very, very efficient. It's, you know, it's reliable and it's practically the gold standard for desalination. So FO will not replace RO for at least for the application, which RO is very good. However, FO can be used in application where RO cannot be used or when RO has some problems. And this is what I would like to go to the last section to describe the application. And this is what I view the potential application of FO uh, from the reason that I described earlier. First, high salinity feed waters that cannot be treated by RO. RO can treat anything up to 40,000 ppm. And if you have high salinity like brines or shale gas water, you cannot do it by pressure driven membranes like RO. So this is one application. The second one is very challenging to treat uh, wastewater or, or brines. Because of the low fouling propensity of FO, it may be beneficial, although the energy will be slightly higher, it may be beneficial because you will not need to do extensive pretreatment and, and, and cope with this fouling. The third one is a zero liquid discharge, and I'll show you some schemes where FO can fit very nicely in zero liquid discharge. And the last one that I think it may be also in pretreatment to improve the performance of conventional desalination technologies like RO or even uh, thermal desalination. I would like to uh, talk about the first application, which is now there are some uh, com uh, companies that uh, commercialize units, and this is application in the oil and gas. I'm not sure if you can see the details here, but when you look at the typical wastewater th that come from the shale gas industry, like this is an example for the Marcellus shale, you can get very, very high salinities and very, very high hardness. I think it will be clear if you see it here. From this table, the salinity can, can be as high as seven times the salinity of seawater. The hardness can be 55,000 ppm. I've never seen any water of this kind of hardness. Alkalinity is very high, calcium is very high, and this, of course, cannot be treated by RO. So I would like now to show you some application of FO to treat uh, this kind of uh, uh, water. And one of the applications, the first one is a company hydration technology. They use uh, what they call the green machine. And uh, in a way, it's relatively simple. They just have a truck and they have four osmosis unit. The draw solution that they use is sodium chloride, high concentration. On one side of the membrane, they have sodium chloride. The other side, they have this very, very, very dirty water that you cannot treat otherwise. And even this water is very dirty. It looks like here, very dark. Water can permeate through the membrane with no fouling, so you dilute the draw solution so you can use this diluted water maybe to developing some other uh, uh, wells and then you minimize the volume of the waste, which is, again, a, 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 also a good thing to do. I would like to show now another application that uh, use forward osmosis for treating of very high salinity brine, 
And this is the forward osmosis process that use thermolytic draw solution. And in, in this case, this is ammonia and carbon dioxide that once you dissolve them, how long, I have two minutes? Uh, Oh, yeah, too. So you dissolve ammonia and CO2, uh, you create very high osmotic pressure, you can have water going through, and then you separate the ammonia and CO2 by applying a low-grade heat and use it again. So, and indeed, uh, there is some application. Again, this was a, a company, Oasis Water, that pu published this paper. This is a pilot with a Marcellus shell, and they were able to show that you can get water with 75,000 ppm that you cannot treat by RO, and get it all the way down to 300 milligrams per liter. So now, since then, they improved the system, and they have now some uh, application in a, a coal-fired power plants in China uh, to uh, treat the water there. Another important application is zero liquid discharge scheme. And indeed, I've been in China in the summer, and, and I met with several companies, uh, several industries, and they indicate, many of them, that now they are required to have zero liquid discharge. The coal-fired power plant need to go to zero liquid discharge, and also some other industries. And one way to do it is you can first concentrate it to some level by RO, whatever RO can have. And what they were doing so, uh, up to now, after the RO, they were going to either mechanical vapor compression or some other thermal processes. And in the end, they're going to a crystallizer. Uh, in this, uh, I mean, uh, Oasis was able to show, and again, uh, there are some studies and, and, and pilots, to show that you can replace the mechanical vapor compression by forward osmosis and achieve zero liquid discharge scheme. So again, you need to concentrate it up to the point that RO cannot handle, then FO kicks in and, and, and bring it up to, and then the crystallizers uh, form, I mean, uh, form salt so you can get zero liquid discharge. The last application that I would like to talk is about pretreatment for conventional desalination technologies. This is just an idea that we have in this review article that will be published very soon. And in a way, uh, many desalination processes are not efficient and you cannot go to very high recovery because of fouling and scaling. Uh, for example, if you treat water from the Red Sea of uh, algae bloom uh, and so on. So you can use, take advantage of the FO is very low fouling and use it as a pretreatment and FO will not scale and eventually the RO or whatever the other desalination unit can work with a relatively clean solution and operate uh, very well. So I would like now to conclude because I see the stop sign soon. So uh, let's see, I, I divide it to the good and the bad, the, pro the promise and the challenges. The good things are it's low, uh, FO is as low fouling propensity, can treat high salinity brines that cannot be treated by RO, can treat challenging wastewaters because of the low fouling propensity, and can be integrated in a, a zero liquid discharge scheme, as I showed you earlier. However, there are uh, many challenges for FO, including the applications that I mentioned, and we need still to develop a, a low-cost, high-performance membranes. We need to be on the range when I indicated there that structural parameter close to 100 and very high A over B values. Uh, we need to minimize the reverse salt flux, which is directly related to the membranes. Uh, and also we need more pilot demonstrations and more uh, full-scale systems either uh, built or analyzed. So lastly, I would like to thank uh, the people who did all the work, the collaboration with Korea University and Wollongong University, the funding agencies, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, we can take uh, one or two questions here. So let's, if I have one, there's one right there, in the middle, right in the middle. Nice presentation, Manny. Um, Kerry Howe from University of New Mexico. Um, so you made the comment that um, FO doesn't follow as much as RO, and, and related to that, to the pressure. It seems to me it might also be related to the concentration in the boundary layer at the uh, membrane surface and that um, the concentration there is related to the flux toward the membrane and the back diffusion away from the membrane, which is the concentration gradient. So as you, get, as you design your membranes with higher flux, can you picture getting to the situation where FO membranes might foul more, maybe start uh, approaching the fouling of RO membranes because of that? higher flux giving you a higher concentration at the membrane surface? Yeah, I mean, uh, many, many. Microphone. 
answer your first part, I mean, whatever you have concentration polarization in FO and RO, they are identical. So there is nothing, assuming that you neglect what the reverse salt flux, which may affect, it's to the first or approximation, it's about the same. Secondly, the same problem that we have in RO, we will not be able to operate with high flux because of the same problem that we have in RO. So this is why, you know, all these high flux membrane in RO will never materialize because of the problem that you mentioned. So I will, I'll say practically you will have the same problems. And the fact that you have low fouling, and we showed it, and I don't have the data, it's directly related to the compressibility due to hydraulic pressure. Okay, this will be the, the last one here. It looks like Phil way over there. Uh, many in um, in these uh, these, frac these uh, fracking uh, applications for fluid osmosis, what kind of salt concentrations do you build up in the waste brine, and what kind of volume reductions do you get? So for the Mic microphone, yeah, I, I'm loud. <laughs> for the example that I show, you start from 75,000 to 300, they will achieve 75 percent recovery. Now, in the other application, in the coal fire power plant in China, the company want to bring it all the way to 26%, and then move to the crystallizer. Mm -hmm.